I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to the front room sessions at the Marcus Garvey House in North Minneapolis. My guests today are cast members from La Traviata, which is now playing at Minnesota Opera. Joining me for this midday interview are Cecilia Lopez, Nicole Cabell, and Stephen Martin. Welcome, all of you, to the Marcus Garvey House. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. I am so happy to be uh, in your presence that you have decided to come to our community to share something about your work, your story, and uh, in a sense, invite our world into a world of beauty, a world of, um, of genius, I believe. But first of all, uh, maybe uh, Cecilia, talk about this production, La Traviata, and your role in it. Oy. Well, <clears throat> my role in it, uh, we, uh, Nicole and I actually, we share the role of Yoletta, who's uh, the, the lead soprano role, if you will, in the story, La Traviata. And um, she, her story is a story that may, I think a lot of people can identify with because she is a woman that is searching for love, but not really, she doesn't want to give in to the idea of being loved. And then when Alfredo comes along and there is a possibility of someone that's really just putting his feelings out there for her and it, it kind of shakes her, it makes her, you know, she's a little hesitant and, but, but then I'll I also give you a backstory that Violeta, she's, she has tuberculosis and mm -hmm. that's, she's presented that way in this production. The, there's a, a waltz in the beginning in the prelude that our choreographer uh, uh, choreographed for us, and it shows. It shows the Violeta and how much she's, sh how sick she is, mm -hmm. but then it moves on to the party scene because she's putting up a wall and she doesn't want to, to I, I guess accept the fact that she's dying and she wants to live this carefree life and go big, you know, go <laughs> or go home. But again, she's. She, I think she really does want to find love, and when Alfredo comes in, the story unfolds. She goes to act two, lives in the countryside with him, and then mm -hmm. dad comes in and throws a curveball at her, and, and it's just one of those stories, again, that it's very real, very real. A lot of people can really identify with Violeta and what she goes through. And in the end, spoiler, she, <laughs> she, she dies. She, uh. she dies, She's, but she really does. We see her cling on to life as much as she can and then especially in act three when Alfredo comes back and she's really just hoping to, she believes that she will get better and she will live the happy life with Alfredo and, and we see her have that little burst of energy, that burst of life and no pain and then at the end she's just, it, the music too, is, she was so dramatic the mm -hmm. way it's, it's built into that story. Oh, it's just so beautiful. Everyone should well, come and see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. We opened up with uh, the music uh, from Nicole Cabell. Nicole, thank you for being here first. What was that piece that you were singing? Adieu de la hôtesse arabe. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a piece by Bizet, who composed Carmen. Mm -hmm. So you notice that it has a, a, a bit of exoticism to the music. Um, but it's about a Western traveler mm -hmm. in um, Arabia. And um, the woman who falls in love with him, um, but he has to leave. So yeah. sounds a familiar, a familiar <laughs> so, <laughs> idea. Yeah. So, 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 sorry. Not that so she beautiful. Dies, <laughs> and, and La Traviata. What does it mean? What does the, the title mean? La Traviata. The fallen woman. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So this is a. In this, this takes place in a, a I guess 1850 is where around the mid 19th century is where it's set and. Um, she was a courtesan, mm -hmm. but in that time, the courtesan wasn't, she was quote unquote a prostitute, but in that time, it was a sort of different role. Um, she was a bit of a socialite, right? So important men could have a courtesan on their arm, and that was looked at as a status symbol. And yet, so she could enjoy all of the luxuries of somebody with status, except for the highest sort of honor um, of a woman, which of course at the time was marriage to an honorable man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so when Cecilia spoke about Papa coming in in act two, this is Alfredo. Uh, Alfredo's father comes in and says, um, yeah, so I know you guys are together, but Alfredo has a sister, by the way. And because of your status as a fallen woman, um, somebody with not, you know, Basically, he does consider her 
a prostitute. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the man who is supposed to marry Alfredo's sister is threatening not to marry her. So he's saying, please have pity on this family. And you can almost see where his father's coming from. Mm-hmm. He thinks, look, my son doesn't know any better. He'll change his mind. He's fickle. All men are fickle. You'll find mm-hmm. somebody else. <laughs> but my daughter won't find somebody else. Mm-hmm. So please do this for our family. You'll be fine. We won't if you don't do this. So Family owner. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So she's really, it's the hardest decision she has ever had to make. And it is incredibly painful. And she says over and over again, she will sacrifice Alfredo for this, but she is going to die. And this means spiritually as well as physically. Mm-hmm. Stephen, your, your role. Mm. So I'm singing Alfredo, the lover of uh, Violetta. And uh, he uh, steals her heart to even her surprise. And uh, much like these two said, he, he doesn't understand what he's getting into or the implications on his family. And he really doesn't care. Um, for better or for worse. Um, so when Alfredo's father comes in and convinces Violetta to um, essentially dump him, and she says, like, well, he'll chase after me. You know, it's not going to work, you know. Um, so she, she breaks up with him, and she does not reveal why. You know, she doesn't betray his father to him. Uh, and it's interesting because in Act 2, Scene 2, there's a scene where, uh, out of anger, he just got broken up with her by a letter. Um, he goes to a party that Violetta is at, and um, kind of like a petulant child, he, he embarrasses her in front of everyone and uh, gets a stack of money and throws it at her in front of everyone and, and pays her for her services, mm-hmm. you know. And it's a, a horrible, horrible mm-hmm. scene, and uh, he just doesn't, he doesn't understand how over his head uh, he is right now. And... Um, he, his father enters and tells him that you're not the son that I knew. Why are you doing this to this poor woman? And uh, <laughs> Alfredo runs out uh, embarrassed and sad. And uh, luckily the father has a change of heart-ish. Uh, I think he feels bad for his actions, though that's debatable. Um, and Alfredo and Violetta are reunited before she dies um, in a really beautiful way, heartbreaking way. You know, they both really love each other. Mm-hmm. and. Um, it's just a, a, a commentary on status and um, classism and how that uh, plays a role in people's family dynamics. So it's, it's a really interesting commentary on social life. Let me ask you as artist how you prepare and get into the roles. The story you're telling is a powerful story. It's human. Mm-hmm. It's global, universal. But to deliver that story with power and credibility, what do you do? Uh, where's that place in you, uh, n- uh, Nicole, that allows you to uh, convince both yourself and the universe that this is a truth that uh, everyone uh, can experience, yeah. has mm-hmm. access to? That's a great question. I think it's, you know, if you were acting, if we were acting this and we didn't have to sing it, there could be a different kind of investment in, in this. But I think, you know, because this is an opera and it's really tough to sing, um, you sort of, I don't know, I do the work beforehand. <laughs> I, I do the research, of course, know exactly what I'm saying um, and all the subtext behind what I'm saying. And I usually speak the text, um, kind of act it out without the music. Um, this is in the learning process of the role. And uh, then, you know, you, you have to do that so that that kind of is second nature, that all of her thoughts and her um, motivations are second nature. And then you have to spend probably years <laughs> getting this kind of a role into your voice <laughs> um, so that that's second nature. And then they kind of dance together. Um, you have moments on stage where you really, you're doing five things at once. Mm-hmm. You're looking at the conductor, you're listening to your tenor, trying to balance, trying to project, making sure your words are correct, um, making sure that you are conveying the emotion to the audience. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're aware of the audience, aren't you? Well, you know, you try not to be. You try to have this sort of, you you kind of can't help it. If the lights are up, you see them. (laughs) 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 Um, Most of the time, the lights aren't up. Um, But yeah, you you sort of, there's something really energizing, though, about having the audience there. I usually do a better job um, in front of people than when I'm just kind of 
doing it in the practice room or singing for it, you have the motivation because you want to tell them the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And especially if they're receptive. Um, but then, of course, on a just very practical level, you just have to make sure that you're prepared to be an opera singer, to do the music justice, because the music tells a story. It's all there. Yes. The emotions are in it, written into the music. Um, so if you just are a, um, a mirror for what the composer is intending, um, then you shouldn't have to go much more beyond that. Yes. Then it becomes self-indulgent. So yeah. you just kind of do what he tells you to do, and then it, the audience <laughs> usually gets what his, his message. And if he's created something that's powerful like this, I'm sure uh, there is a, an element of magic that happens of its own volition. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cecilia, uh, do you experience things on stage that surprise you? When you're doing the lines, you're singing the song, you're interacting, you've got five things going at one time. Is there a time where all of a, something, all of a sudden something big or something different happens that transports you and the audience? Absolutely. Every time something, it's, I never tire of singing this role. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a challenging role, but it's, it's one of the, again, it's one of those stories that to me, as Cecilia, I, I identify a lot with Violeta, and so it's, it's fun to rediscover new things in what I'm singing. But yeah, even in the moment, there are bits, like for example, the, the act two duet with the papa, when the, that comes in papa jemo, is what we call them. <laughs> and that duet and how selfless that Violeta is and how much she's willing to sacrifice because she loves Alfredo and she wants them to be happy and it's every time it, it, whether it's not necessarily it doesn't catch me by surprise let's say but it's always beautiful and it's always moving and it's always magical it's something that I consider magical and it's um incredibly it gets me it moves me to tears and and just to 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 know if I Cecilia were asked in that position mm -hmm. you know and here's this this man coming and tell, accusing me of things mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. telling me to to leave the picture so that someone else can be happy. Uh, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, sure. it's it's a lot. It's a lot to handle. But the, again, those moments are the they are the magic and they are the things that we live for as artists because they they motivate us to to keep on doing what we do because it's it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but we love it. Let me ask each of you how, how you have come to your career. Uh, I love the enthusiasm of the story you're telling me right now. I appreciate it so much. And, um, but I, I, I want to get a sense of how you arrived at your career. Uh, so I'll start with you, Nicole Cabell. Uh, how did you emerge into the artist that you have become? And, and where are you going with the art? What do you think? Uh, so yeah, I mean everybody, it's so funny, you can trace it back so far, right? You know, we all started in choirs or, you know, little voice lessons here and there. I'll start a little later <laughs> and say um, I was about, I don't know, 18, I guess, when I decided I wanted to do this. Um, and so I uh, applied to major uh, uh, in vocal performance at several universities and I decided on the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, um, which was wonderful. It's where I met my future husband. <laughs> are you a New Yorker? Are you a New Yorker? No, I'm actually a Southern Californian. I couldn't have moved further away. It's like a <laughs> diagonal across the states. Um, but yeah, so I so I did that, um, and I was very lucky to be accepted into an apprentice program at um, a big opera company, at the Chicago Lyric Opera, and that was right after. I'm very lucky. I mean, I worked my butt off, of course, like everybody, <laughs> mm -hmm. but. Um, I just thought the timing was really good. So they had an opening for a voice type of mine at this program, which is like, um, you can consider it like a medical internship. You know, you get paid to learn, which is amazing. Um, so that was three years, and then I won a competition afterwards, again, right after. Um, and that competition it was the BBC Cardiff Singer of the World competition in Wales, and that competition was televised. So that uh, televised for millions of people, and so that was basically an audition for the whole world. Wow. And um, I've been working steadily ever since. I was lucky because of that. I didn't have to sort of do major audition tours or go around and, um, you know, kind of, well, again, just audition for people. I, I, I have been um, learning 
technique my whole life. It never came easy for me. Um, and I sort of grew up on, in the spotlight, on stage um, from the time I won that competition on, which has been great, but also difficult. So, um, because you're, you're kind of figuring things out with your voice, but you're in front of thousands of people in the big houses. So, <laughs> um, that's, that's my individual path. And it's, I, th I think it's slightly an unusual path. Um, because I didn't have sort of periods where I didn't work. I call them purgatory to my students <laughs> now. <laughs> and I say my students because now I'm a, a professor. I took a professorship when I'm not singing. They're extremely patient with me because I haven't been there very much. But um, my intention is to move more into that, um, to decrease my singing load and to um, spend more time um, with my students. Uh, DePaul University in Chicago. And um, of course, keep singing. <laughs> it's just finding the magic balance. That's my, that's my future, is finding the ma magic balance and, and to just keep singing my favorite music and my favorite roles. I've done everything on my bucket list now. So, that's amazing. Yeah. That's wonderful. And I'm that's tired. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Stephen, jump in. Uh, Stephen Martin, what's your path, your story? Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short, but it's kind of cute. So I'll tell you some parts <laughs> of it. Um, by, uh, I grew up playing piano. My grandma taught me piano lessons, so I went over to her house every Friday and learned piano and stayed the night. And I uh, grew up singing in church, so I never had any formal... What church? What kind of church? Uh, it was Oakland Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Shout out. Um, <laughs> and uh, my dad was the music director there, uh, and he's a fabulous singer. Uh, he's so good, in fact, that I was too afraid to ever sing in front of him. <laughs> so I sing in choir, but I never had a voice lesson, only piano and a little bit of trombone. And then when high school hit, I played football, and I got pretty good at that. So music dropped off, and then I started getting recruited to colleges for football. Um, and I needed to pick a major, and I thought, well, I haven't sung or had a voice lesson in my life. Maybe I'll major in voice. I have no idea why. Very, very silly, but um, I went and auditioned the places that I was getting recruited for football, and they said, you actually could have a career singing. Maybe you should do this instead. So I dropped sports altogether and ended up at uh, Michigan State University and spent a lot of time there, uh, got uh, all of my degrees there, including a theory degree, music theory degree. Um, and then I started doing the audition circuit and ended up at some pretty decent apprenticeships, like Santa Fe and places like that. And now here I am. So I'm at Minnesota, I'm a resident artist. So I'm doing that kind of resident internship that Nicole was talking about right now. And part of that is getting the opportunity to sing Alfredo, which is a pretty big deal. So pretty happy to be here. Life is good. Great story. Yeah. Great story. <laughs> and so Cecilia, uh, bring the microphone to you. Oh, mine's kind of a long story. Because <laughs> I was not exposed to opera as a kid. I grew up singing mariachi music with my mom because we used to go beats out in the fields of Idaho. And to make the time go by faster, mom was always the one Again, having the magical moments of using music to, to sing to me and my, my older brother um, to make the hours go by faster because we hated it there. <laughs> we hated working out in the fields. Beats and beats yeah, and beats. Yeah. yeah. And, but that's where my love of music was really, really grew. That's where it started because of mom. She taught me all the songs that she grew up singing as a kid and she was the one that taught me how to sing in harmony in the third so we were just okay so tu canta la segunda and you can and okay yeah whatever <laughs> um but that was my what my life consisted of growing up in idaho to mexican parents it was just all the mariachi music mm -hmm. and in fact i learned to speak english from watching sesame street and the the back then was when um opera singers used to make cameo appearances mm -hmm. on sesame street mm -hmm. And I remember seeing Beverly Sills, who is like the the good old hardy American soprano that we now that I actually really admire. But back in the day, little Cecilia, I didn't know who she was. I just thought, oh, this is a strange lady singing some strange music on Sesame Street. <laughs> um, but then, so fast forward to my grown-up days. I was a mother. I, I my daughter was one year old when I started to pursue. A music degree but it was in teaching I wanted to be a music teacher because um, that seemed like the right choice for me because I was a new mom and my 
now ex-husband, but my then husband, he was starting his, his business. And so, so I just, you know, I thought being a music teacher is a good hearty job for me and it's going it's to be good. And then I went and saw my first opera, which was La Boheme. It was a school production. Mm -hmm. And I just went because I wanted to be supportive of my upperclassmates who were my friends. And but I went not having any concept of what <laughs> to expect. I didn't realize there was going to be an orchestra. I didn't know there was going to be a set, the costumes. I didn't know we were going to have super titles. I didn't know the synopsis of the story. So I, I went and the story's progressing. I thought, oh, it's, it's beautiful to see my friends up on the stage and, and in the pit with our conductor, who was our professor. And I looked over to my, my ex-husband and I told him, well, Mimi's going to be okay. She's got to be okay. <laughs> and I had no idea. So, and then at the end, the tenor grabs her. And, well, he, he looks around like, why are you guys looking at me that way? And by that time, Mimi has already passed away. And he grabs her, Mimi! <laughs> oh, the, the streaming of the tears, and I was so moved. I'm a big crybaby too, so, <laughs> but but I just I, that's that was a pivotal moment for me, and I it made me change my my major, and I wanted to be able to. I thought if if someone if my friends made me feel the, the way that I feel now, being so moved by this story, by this this art form that has existed for this long. Mm -hmm and something that I've never been exposed to, but yet it made me feel this way. I want to be able to do that for people in the audience, you know? And mm -hmm. so, and that's what I did. I became obsessed with our vo with vocal technique. I was, uh, soup. my daughter probably resents me now for it because I would take her to my, my rehearsals with my pianist and we would rehearse about three times a week and I'd have my voice lessons. Sometimes my daughter would be asleep in my mm -hmm. voice lessons mm -hmm. and, and on the floor. She was just so used to it. <laughs> and, um, I, yeah, I graduated from UNLV, Las Vegas, Nevada, with my vocal performance degree, and immediately after that, I got hired by Opera San Jose, and just been slowly mm -hmm. climbing that ladder. And but I, I love it. Again, it's a lot of hard work. I think you guys would agree with me. It's just what we do is is, is it's hard. It's challenging. It's a, it's a lot of sacrifices, but we love it. So let me sort of end this program with uh, both an observation and a question that you can reflect on and respond to. Uh, I started off by saying how uh, thankful and grateful I am that you've come here to North Minneapolis. So this is an African-American community. And what I've read about and written about in Insight News, in fact, our cover for today's mm -hmm. paper uh, is a beautiful uh, presentation of uh, Nicole Cabell. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. And uh, I think that's Jesus, right? Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Jesus Leon. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so the organization is intentionally reaching out to communities of color. So there was the notion, like you said, you hadn't really been familiar with opera before. There is a notion that opera is for them, the elite or the, uh, the well-off people. But really it, it wasn't because in Italy, it was the music of the people, right? Mm -hmm. And in Europe, it's music, period. And it's accessible to everybody. So I'm seeing you all, by your presence and by your work and by your passion, your love, sort of a rekindling in the organization, rekindling its commitment to share the music with the people, mm -hmm. everybody. And you're inviting everybody and you're just reminding people the stories we are telling are the stories of everybody. So you can respond to that, and, and if you would, uh, with the final note, talk about the, the notion of gift and training. You obviously mm -hmm. each have been blessed with a gift, but the gift alone uh, requires mm -hmm. so much work, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a big, a big thing to grapple with, but uh, Nicole Cabell, just your reaction, response, uh, thoughts. Mm -hmm. Too good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Glad you're <I'll> first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about the gift and the training uh, first, which is that's absolutely true. Um, that you have, you know, you you can have the the occasional slightly tragic situation where somebody has the the desperate desire to become 
an artist of some form and they don't necessarily have the feet to dance, the, the voice to sing, the eye for art um, by the standards of making money from it, right? Because everybody can sing, you know? Everybody can dance, everybody can draw. Um, but yes, when it comes to this professional world, um, you, you do, you just have to, you have to have a voice that people simply want to hear. The tone color, mm -hmm. it needs to be something pleasing to the ear. Um, I say for all of my colleagues in this production and second cast, amazing second cast colleagues, red cast, let's say second cast, orange cast, red cast, um, that the voices are incredible and anybody would pay to hear these voices. Um, and training, what, what happens of course, you find out you have one of these instruments, somebody hears you and they go, that's pretty, that's pretty sound, that's a powerful sound. Um, training is, I mean, it's like anything else, right? It's like somebody training to be a football player or a doctor and it's just hours and hours and hours. And that's what, you know, that's what we ultimately, that's what our, our paycheck checks are justified by the amount of hours we spent in years prior to those three hours on stage, mm -hmm. learning everything from how to pronounce French, German, Italian, Spanish, um, and Czech, all these languages operas are written in, um, to making your voice even, you know, you have to make sure the voice sounds um, even from the top to the bottom. No microphones. You, no, no microphones. No microphones. Yeah, yeah. You have to sing over that orchestra. Never uh, microphones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a very specific type of training that you have to get to sing um, without a microphone. Mm -hmm. um, and I can go on and on about it, but then you'd have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're professional. Right? <laughs> that's why you're professional. <laughs> but I'm going to have breath control, all those things. But yes, most of us undergo years of consistent, daily, rigorous mm -hmm. training um, to be able to do this, mm -hmm. to make it hopefully look easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it looks too difficult, <laughs> sometimes it is for us. And if you, you have to be able to get through that. It's like running a marathon every time you sing an opera. So um, that's what sometimes separates the, the girls from the women, <laughs> the men from the boys, mm -hmm. right? Is who can withstand that? Who can do that? Who can be there? on time uh, every week for their lesson, who can commit that um, discipline in their life to, to learning those skills, who can not talk and scream at baseball games and, and drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes, who can live this discipline lifestyle, right? Um, in order to do the training, and of course, the other aspect is musical intelligence. You just have to be able to, if somebody tells you something conceptually, you have to be able to understand it. Um, Imitation sometimes even helps. So you have to have the brain to, mm -hmm. to be able to understand how to make yourself better, right? So it's this sort of magic mixture of all the right elements coming together. Mm -hmm. And then of course luck and connections and mm -hmm. all that and how you look. So we can go on and on about well, what great. makes a career, right? But <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what you do. Your, your gift is the, the, the very like small slice of that pie and all the rest of it is how to make your gift um, something that somebody's really going <laughs> to pay to, to hear on stage. Yeah, can you do justice to the composer yeah. in the end and please the audience? Um, and on your first point, I think, you know, Minnesota Opera has always been on the forefront of um, um, casting um, diverse, creating diverse casts, and, um, and they're also very forward thinking in terms of what operas they put on. Traviata is a traditional opera, but they always, they always, um, don't they usually commission a new opera it's every, every year, almost yeah. every year? Um, so they're, they want to be um, an opera for, for everybody, right? So all communities, all different musical tastes. Um, and I have to say that is, from my observation, I hope I'm right, I think that is something that most opera companies are trying to do now, you know, because they realize it's, it's a changing world and the art form has to stay relevant. And it's an incredible, gorgeous art form that everybody should be exposed to. So there's no reason to not try to get it out in communities and I th all, all different communities. And I think having a diverse cast is, is helpful in that way because, you know, um, for me, when I was, 
seems like longer I, before these guys, even no. ten years before these guys, <laughs> when I was training. <laughs> there wasn't many. There weren't many uh, women on stage that looked like me, and there were a couple, um, but not. That was very much not the rule, and it was. It always kind of stuck with me as I was going. Well, you know, is this going to is this going to be something that is an issue? And I think several times it has been. You know, they wanted somebody that looked like a European uh, princess, somebody that um, is is physically what they think that the character in the opera should look like. Um, but I do think there's really a concerted effort now to change that. I see it at the Metropolitan Opera and HD broadcasts um, all over the world, really. I work, I work all over the world, and I, I've been seeing this in the last 10 years change and I hope it continues, but um, bravo to Minnesota Opera for being one of the um, pioneers in this way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you've said it all. <laughs> I talk <laughs> that, a lot. That, that, was, oh, no, that was powerful, wow. uh, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but Stephen, you know, add to it, if you would, you, just uh, sure. as, the, as the intern, uh, as you called it, at the uh, company, at well, the in-residence artist yeah, there. Yeah. So you're watching this day yeah. by day internally. What's your take? Um, yeah, it, it's been it's been lovely. So I've been with the company since September, um, and I can't tell you how ahead of the curve Minnesota Opera is on um, with regards to um, inclusiveness and diversity and equity. And they've actually been doing this year. They've hired a company to come in and talk to all of the staff, um, like shop members, everyone, um, specifically about how we can use our cultural differences to enhance the work that we do and the art that we create. And it's been absolutely fabulous. And they, the interesting thing is they, they don't focus on how, can, how are we all the same, how can we all feel like we're connected, but rather, what are all the ways that we're different and how can we use those to our advantage in our company, which is a little bit different than how people have been approaching it in recent years. And I think it shows um, throughout every level of the company in a really special way. And as far as representation on stage, um, it, it was funny for uh, Straw Hat, uh, the leading tenor is Asian. And there were, there were people in the audience who were Asian that were so floored to see an Asian person in a leading role. And, and it was just really special. And they mentioned it. It was one of the things that made them feel like they were more connected to the opera. You know, so I think they're doing a lot of things right um, at Minnesota Opera, which is really um, special. And as far as uh, gifts and talent and training, um, Nicole said it all really well. I, I, I think of it, uh, if you're trying to be a painter, um, you get gifted um, how much paint you have and how pretty the paint is uh, on your palette and how, how many different beautiful colors you might have. Some people are unfortunately only given gray and they can do the best they can with that. Some people have a wide palette of beautiful colors, but that doesn't make them any better at painting. So um, if they can learn to use all those colors in a magnificent way, then they can make something beautiful, but they have to have the work ethic, the um, intelligence, all of those extra factors that are completely separate from the voice you've been given. And so it's really just your talent is floating around in the ether and, and unless you can actually do something with it and harness it, it just is there for you to wish that you had done something with, you know. So there's a, there's a balance and, and yeah, talent without work ethic just disappears. I love the way you describe it. That's wonderful. That's yeah. powerful. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Cecilia, I'm going to finish with you. Thank you so much oh for being goodness. here. Oh, my goodness. And so... <laughs> what, There's what not much for me to say <laughs> after <laughs> what these guys said. <laughs> no, but, but I guess piggybacking just a little bit on the, on the talents and whatnot. It's just, it really is all about tenacity. And, and no matter how many times you get rejected. I don't know about you guys. I've gotten a whole bunch of no's. <laughs> but it always took just the, like a golden solid yes. Mm -hmm. And to really take that opportunity and to work hard to really make the most of that golden opportunity and to add to my career and to, and to learn from it really. Because I 
still take voice lessons, guys. <laughs> like, I've heard, like, I still so go see my teacher for tune-ups <laughs> and re- to remind me of what to do when I get to a high C or something. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's always a, when I, when I get young artists that ask me for advice, and w- one of the things that I say is just never give up. Mm-hmm. Never give up and just keep on working. And if it's something that you really want, and if you, with every... <laughs> ounce every strength in you in your body and your soul and you really believe that it's for you then go for it make, it, for happen. it. make yeah. it happen for sure i'm al mcfarland this has been a, a front room session at the marcus garvey house my guest members of the cast of la traviata which is playing uh, at the ordway it's a production of minnesota opera it plays through may 19th in fact may 19th is insight news day so if you get a chance to uh, go before then, but certainly go then as well. And uh, we are going to be part of a uh, post-show conversation, I think, and that should be fun as well. So I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with members of the cast and with you if you are in attendance on that day. But um, through May 19th, Matria Traviata playing at Minnesota Opera. Again, my thanks to Cecilia Lopez. Thank you, Cecilia. Mm-hmm. Uh, my thanks to Stephen Martin. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. And my thanks to Nicole Cabell. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. So you guys are awesome. I could uh, listen to you. We have a lot to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you're inspiring. So the way you phrase it, the way you frame it, the way you explain it, you make things crystal clear. 